In part two, you have the chance to explore firsthand with our UNBL partners and data providers as they bring to uh, well, what they bring to the platform. Uh, if you are just joining, uh, welcome. We just had a great first uh, session where we got to know uh, more about the UN Biodiversity Lab and some of the views from uh, UN um, agencies and uh, national governments about the importance of using uh, spatial data. Um, in part two, uh, now uh, we have a chance to go deep with uh, three UNBL data providers. Uh, UNBL has a huge range of amazing data providers. So the three we have with us today are just uh, the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> the UNBL partnership goal is to give you the opportunity to interact with different data providers at the various the events moving forward. So this is just the beginning. The three data providers we will be highlighting today are the Global Mangrove Watch Impact Observatory and the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. All right, um, thanks very much. So I'm just gonna spend a few minutes um, going through a bit more detail on our uh, work around the Global Mangrove Watch, which is uh, work that um, started out with a, a project as part of the Kyoto Carbon Initiative of the Japanese um, Space Agency. Uh, and really kind of Orko, Rosequist and Richard Lucas are the ones who started a lot of this initiative off. Um, so our, our real aim here, or overall aim, um, is to map what has happening with, uh, with uh, what is happening with the world's mangroves. So how they're, what is the extent and how is that extent changing? So from that point of view, we're looking at creating baseline maps and then maps of change from that baseline. And going forward, we're currently developing uh, methods and starting to put data out there where we're doing more near real time alerts. By near real time, we often mean somewhere in the kind of monthly um, kind of range. So the baseline map, currently the baseline year is 2010. Um, so there's two versions of this um, data which are around. Uh, the data that's currently um, on the biodiversity lab is the version two data. This is the data that's been available since 2018. Just recently, um, the publication has just come out this month, um, is an update to this baseline, um, for, so version 2.5. So in this instance, we've um, if you found any areas in the data that you found were missing um, or were maybe not as good quality as we would like, hopefully a lot of those things have been fixed in this version 2.5. And you can see in the uh, top figure in the top left here, uh, the areas in red, these are the areas that we have updated as part of the uh, 2.5 baseline uh, map. Uh, over the coming year, um, so by, the, by this time next year, we should have an update, um, updated map, which will be a new baseline year, which is 2020. And that'll be based on uh, the imagery from the European Space Agency Sentinel-2 satellite. And therefore we'll be going down to a pixel resolution of 10 meters rather than the um, 25 meter that the current maps um, are at. We also produce change layers. This change is based off uh, uh, spaceborne radar data uh, from the Japanese. Uh, and this video on the left-hand side here is showing you part of the way we, which we do that change detection. The radar data is sensitive to the vertical structure um, of, the, of the mangrove forests. So we make assumptions around that mudflats and worm, uh, water bodies are low backscatter. Um, so they have a, a low response in the radar, while a mangrove forest um, has a high backscatter. It's got a lot of vertical structure. And essentially what we're looking for is that difference in vertical structure. So in this example in Indonesia, which was shown in the video, uh, you see areas which have been cleared um, and then they go from high backscatter, a mangrove forest to low backscatter, uh, and then they get detected a change. So we're very much making this assumption about a structural change um, occurring um, on the land surface as we map um, change. The real advantage of using this uh, radar data is that it sees through the clouds. So if we use optical data, uh, such as Landsat or Sentinel-2, then we have to do a lot of work around masking clouds and we get errors induced uh, from the cloud masking uh, 
this radar data sees through the clouds so we get uh, complete coverages so we can do regular updates uh, of the mapping very easily um well, more easily um so we've just uh, updated the change layers based off the new 2.5 uh, version baseline uh, and those layers we're currently writing the publication and these layers will be uh, available um, um publicly um later this year so this just gives a few examples of the kind of changes uh, that we're seeing so we've got on the left hand side here uh, East Kilimanjaro in Indonesia. So this is one of the more famous examples where you get a very large areas of, of clearing. French Guiana in the middle here. Um, so this is an area where you've got um, a lot of coastal change, a lot of sediments moving, which is allowing the mangroves to expand um, and to, um, contract. And then the Sandra Barnes in Bangladesh on the on the right hand side here, where you're seeing um, coastal erosion, which is uh, causing the, the mangroves to decrease over the time period. So these are the kind of examples of the kind of mapping you get um, throughout the time series uh, of our layers. In terms of global trends, uh, the global trend is a general uh, downward trend uh, over the time series. You're looking um, at around kind of a net change around 7,000 uh, square kilometers um, from 96 up until 2007. Obviously, if you start looking at individual countries or individual regions, uh, that change uh, changes a bit. And when you start looking at the kind of the independent gains and losses, those pictures uh, change a bit as well. But the general uh, trend um, is one that is going down. Um, there has been maybe some leveling off of that trend more recently, but the, um, that is probably within the error bars of the data set as it stands. The most of the change you won't be surprised here is probably within Southeast Asia, uh, followed by the Americas, and probably there's less change uh, within Africa and uh, Oceania as it stands within the data set. So I'm just waiting for the slide to. Right. Um, so something we've been starting to do more recently uh, is look at uh, near real time change alerts. Uh, so the idea here is rather than the kind of historical kind of baselines we're generating uh, with the um, uh, maps, our baseline maps and change maps, um, it's saying kind of can we do something that gives more up to date information where people can make maybe decisions at a kind of a closer to um, the, the, a change event occurring. Uh, so this is something that we've been working on over the last 18 months or so. Uh, we have a global mangrove watch portal, which I've got a slide on shortly. Uh, in that, that, at the moment, that's the only way you can get access to these change alerts. Um, and what we're doing here is every time a, an, an optical image, either um, Sentinel-2 or a Landsat 8 is being acquired. So that's probably roughly monthly, um, given cloud cover and things like that. Um, we are trying to um, detect whether there's been a loss of mangroves within the um, within the mangrove extent. At the moment, that's based off the the older version two global mangrove watch extents, but we're going to be updating that um, in the coming months. Uh, and we're also looking to expand this to other regions. So. Um, if there are regions where you know there's consistent and lots of changes, then that would be useful information to be fed back. So that might be another area that we can add into the system uh, for testing and things like that as we expand this. In terms of applying these data sets on a national basis, um, obviously I've been talking about being a global data set at the moment. I think at a national basis, probably the most obvious things are doing about what is the national trend in your data in, in mangrove cover, in mangrove extent. Um, but also, are there hotspots of um, gain and loss uh, within your country? I guess the, the question that leads to is whether there are areas you would expect to find changes. Uh, are there changes that are unexpected? Um, and if the alerts cover your country, then obviously those can also be used to identify areas which uh, might be um, changes, uh, which maybe it's illegal deforestation or things like that, potentially. Areas to be careful of if you're working in a country which has got a small ex extent of mangroves, uh, it's worth bearing in mind this is a global product. We've got a minimum mapping unit of around one hectare. Um, so if you're dealing with areas which are um, uh, where you've got small areas of mangroves, but particularly, uh, as I said, this our change is based on structural change. So if you're dealing with mangroves that are perhaps low in biomass, so perhaps small, quite small trees, and then these areas are probably likely to be less like um, less um, accurate um, compared to say a large country like Indonesia or somewhere like that. 
as I said, we have a global mangrove watch portal. Uh, the kind of main difference here is that we're only focused on mangroves. Um, so obviously compared to the, the biodiversity lab where you've got lots of other data sets that you can uh, mix in there uh, and understand what's going on, that um, through this portal, we provide the near to real time change alerts. So um, that's probably the kind of, the, the kind of the, the data set that's only available through this portal. Um, our data sets are also publicly available if you want the GIS layers, uh, so um, you can get those um, links from here as well. The data sets, obviously it's available through the, the UN Biodiversity Lab, where you can mix it in with all the other data sets, but the data set is also uh, used on a number of other portals as well that you, you may be familiar with or you may use. Okay, so that's some slides. Um, I guess maybe we've got questions. Yes. Thank you so much, Pete. Um, I'm always amazed at what has been achieved through Global Mangrove Watch, and I uh, really like the call to action as well around um, for people to share their regional knowledge too. So I'm just going to this back. I, so I saw a few questions come through. I also am aware that Ake is with us. Thank you very much, Ake, for helping to with some of those questions. I believe the one from Mauricio on how, how is the difference between human pressure and pressure due to climate change conditions accounted for. Um, I don't know, Peter, if you'd like to, to touch on that one to begin with. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Jump in the deep end. <laughs> um, yeah, so at the moment, we're not mapping drivers of change. Uh, we're just mapping uh, where mangrove extent is and where it isn't. Um, so we're just detecting change there. There is a paper uh, which was done by some colleagues at NASA, um, Goldberg et al, a couple of years ago, where they used um, the Geary et al mangrove map to look at drivers of change, but that's something we haven't yet uh, kind of brought into the mangrove, man global mangrove watch, which would be good to do, but yeah, on the list. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, we also have one from Esther, I believe. Uh, how are you implementing near real time change assessment? I know you touched on this a little bit, but maybe if uh, you could speak to yes. that a bit more okay. detail. Okay, so at the moment, it's it's been a process of um, uh, learning and experimentation, I guess, of working out how best to do it. So at the moment, that system, as I said, is based on using European Space Agency Sentinel-2 and the USGS Landsat-8 data and shortly Landsat-9 data. Um, and basically what we're doing there is looking for a loss of mangroves, a loss of vegetation cover within the existing Global Mangrove Watch mask. As I said, the, the current the real time alerts are based off um at the older baseline from uh to, um, from 2016 but that will be updated to 2020 shortly um that then runs through a software system that we've written that runs on our computer systems here in our um but as we expand that we're looking at maybe changing to a cloud-based system or something like that but i think that's great thank you very much and i noticed we have a question from um han grasha abdallah apologies if i mispronounced that please oh the floor is yours Yes, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, this is Gracia again. I am happy today to join uh, my fellow UN ambassadors on discussing issues of uh, nature and climate change with the other side there. I have a question to the CEO of Mangrove. How do we partner on working for the issues of climate change that is affecting the world now? Because that is the most biggest crisis. So, and uh, also how we could uh, collect data through the Mangrove system so that it may be able to um, actually be known by our government and some other institution through mangrove. That is my question. Thank you. Okay. Um, I guess that was a bit similar to the first question about drivers of change. Um, drivers of change is difficult because not knowing it, it requires extra information um, on what's going on the ground, particularly if it's a, a climate based driver. Um, I mean, one of the most, I guess, prominent climate based mangrove changes has been the dive back in northern Australia back in 2014, 2015. Um, so there, in, in that sense, our data sets map a change occurred. Uh, but in terms of that drivers, that's where um, it requires uh, people with local knowledge uh, to to come in and to um, interpret the changes that, that we are seeing. So in terms of, um, say yourself, wherever you're working, if you work, if you see changes in the Global Mangrove Watch data, um, first off, if they're incorrect and there's any errors in the data, that's really useful for, for us to have that fed back. 
Um, but secondly, understanding those drivers. If you look on, say, the, uh, the, um, uh, the Biodiversity Lab or the Global Mangrove Watch Portal or any of the other places, this, the, the, the change layers of our data set available, um, if you see where changes are, often the human brain is much better at computers at some, than some of these things of seeing, say, regular features which have clearly been cut out or seeing kind of a gradual change over time where you may see coastal erosion and things like that. And, and separating out something that's a climate driver from, say, a, a process like coastal erosion. Well, coastal erosion might be being induced by sea level change um, or it might be just part of a kind of that coastal system and it might not be directly climate. So separating those things out is, is a very difficult thing to do, I guess. Uh, thanks for joining this breakout. Um, again, I'm Joel Paik with Impact Observatory. Two of my colleagues uh, are on as well, um, Mark Hanel and Gabriel uh, Sicuccio. Um, so if we get into the q and I might turn to them to answer some questions. Um, but I'll just jump in because uh, I want to get to uh, a good conversation. Oh, now my slides aren't changing. So here at Impact Observatory, we believe that there are superheroes, all of you join us today in government, NGOs, and across industries working to save the planet. Um, and we're trying to do our part by building revolutionary AI-powered algorithms and data uh, that enable these superheroes uh, to succeed. Uh, quickly want to note our funders who made um, the great maps that I'm going to share with you possible. Um, Esri, who I'm sure if you're here on a session on geospatial, you're familiar with. Microsoft, um, UN Development Program, uh, and the Gordon Betty Moore Foundation. So land use and land cover maps um, are a really critical um, underlying layer of so many other relevant data sets as we think about biodiversity um, around the world, uh, which is why that's what we're focused on. How do we turn um, all of the satellite imagery that's being collected into useful, actionable information? Um, and so what we've built is a 10 class map. You can see the, the legend here of what classes we count. Um, at 10 meter resolution, meaning each pixel represents a 10 by 10 square of earth uh, for the whole globe. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about how we did this um, and then about how we think it can be used. So the historically global land use land cover maps uh, have had some limitations. Um, they've been at 100 meter resolution uh, or worse, so not, not super high resolution for decision making. Um, they come out uh, not annually or on a delay. It might take two years for an institution to put out a, a global map and they won't update it for several years. Uh, and they might not be truly global. You'll find some really great maps for a particular country or region. Uh, but as we heard about earlier in the presentation, as we look to tackle uh, the post-2020 goals, having consistent, comparable uh, data that comes out at a reliable cadence um, is what we need in order to monitor how we're doing on the post-2020 targets uh, and adjust any actions we need to. So our map seeks to improve on all of these. As I mentioned, it's at 10 meter resolution. It takes us about one week um, of processing time to create uh, an entire global map. Um, and currently we're going to work at an annual level. Um, so we have the 2020 map out, uh, but as I mentioned in my pitch, we will shortly have maps for 2017 through 2021. So here in March of 2022, uh, we'll have last year's composite map uh, out and available for public consumption. Uh, we hope to continue to produce annual updates um, for the world. Uh, but we also have the ability to run uh, semi-annual updates uh, if any particular region or country or project needs even more frequent information. So a little bit about how we did this. Um, we're using machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, to train uh, a computer to take that satellite imagery that comes in um, and turn it into this actual information. So we use European Space Agency, Agency Sentinel-2 data. So that's data that uh, European Space Agency makes free, available to everyone. Um, and we have a uh, training labeled data set. So this is uh, a data set where a human has gone in and marked up the land use types um, uh, that we then feed to the computer, to artificial intelligence, to then go map the whole world. 
it would take you know forever and ever for a human for humans to map every pixel on earth so we leverage uh, cloud computing that's where our partners at microsoft come in to be able to do this at rapid speed uh, and we worked with the national geographic society to produce uh, a training label set with over 5 billion human labeled pixels um, which allows us uh, to do this quickly and most importantly very accurately we wanted to make sure that our data was relevant um, everywhere on earth so in creating those training labels uh, we sought data from all across the globe um, and from 15 different biomes uh, we didn't want our map to be biased towards any one region we wanted to be relevant truly for every country on earth um, and so now I want to talk about how we think um, this data is useful. So all three of the UN conventions, um, and indeed most all of the SDGs, uh, have some component uh, around sustainable management of resources. So my background is actually working in the biodiversity space for a long time and in the uh, forest carbon space. So understanding how forests change um, at, a, at an annual level uh, obviously helps you not only track and report, but look where you might need uh, further interventions. Um, also understanding things like changes in agricultural footprint or changes in urban footprint. Um, so again, when you go back to our 10 classes, uh, anytime that you're trying to make a decision where you need to know uh, what, not just what's gone, is this forest gone, but what did it turn into? Is it due to agricultural expansion and that's what we need to address? Is it due to urban expansion and that's what we should address? How does it tie to drought or seasonal rainfall? So we're not necessarily making um, the, the final analysis. That's where something like UN Biodiversity Lab comes in with all the full range of data sets. But we're trying to provide that uh, timely um, underlying land use information. So when, um, when Annie mentioned the Essential Life Support Areas project, that's one where we think if a country is going to make a 10-year plan, um, being able to monitor that plan every year to understand how you're executing against it is one place uh, our data could come in. Um, or again, forest carbon. Um, when I used to work in that space, Global Forest Watch is a, is a great asset um, and, and is doing some really cutting edge work. Uh, but if you wanna get a um, more updated uh, cadence from your forestry work, that's something where we feel like our map could could really come in play, offering something slightly different, not competing with Global Forest Watch. Uh, or if you're looking to see where, if you work on desertification, understanding uh, where the desert is growing um, from a remote sensing perspective, getting that annual update uh, into your hands to, again, adjust and update plans. Um, I'll stop there because I want to make sure there's time for discussion or questions. Again, happy to speak to uh, either the how we did it or any questions about the use of it. And I personally would love to hear how you think this information is useful to you because um, we want to make sure that as we create these annual maps, we're uh, providing something that's useful. So if there's additional information, additional land use types, um, anything, any feedback on how this might be relevant for your work, I'd love to hear that as well. Good. So indeed, the Joint Research Center of the European Commission, it's the Commission's in-house science service. And uh, we want to make sure that the information we share uh, with all the policymakers is uh, transparent and accessible to all. And we are very keen to work and share uh, this data with the UN Biodiversity Lab. So I will fly through three sets of data sets, which we believe are, are really relevant uh, to, to these sessions. There are more to come, uh, and we're already working with the UN Biodiversity Lab on that. So the first product and set of products is uh, the World Atlas of Desertification. Uh, it's a mixture of uh, biophysical maps, 14 global maps on uh, uh, bi um, environmental issues, biophysical data, socioeconomical socio data. If you merge them together, we call this the convergence of evidence approach. If you overlay uh, typically maps of poverty, maps of water stress, maps of population change, you can already point to areas that are going to need particular attention in terms of uh, environmental degradation. So this is a bit the approach that we adopted with the World Atlas of Desertification. And the map you see here is uh, uh, a zooming in, uh, in, a, in a certain area close to Turkmenistan. Uh, you have a global data sets like that that is shared and accessible through the UN Biodiversity Lab. Um, 
I'm going to go to the next slides. So you have here you have the whole list of all these data sets that uh, we use together. I think it's very important. One of the lessons of the discussions today is really that nobody can work on their own. Uh, we use products, of course, developed by colleagues, by NASA, by other partners. It's by bringing all this data together that we make really information speak and help support decisions. So the World Atlas is really showing the areas that are most in need of attention in terms of environmental degradation. You will find here the link to the Atlas and how to download all of the underlying data sets. So it's also a key product that is uh, related to uh, SDG goal 15. Uh, that's something that is also, of course, uh, linked to everything. It's very transversal, of course. Another product you may be familiar with uh, that has been developed by Google uh, in collaboration with us, of course. It's uh, really a long time survey analysis of every single pixel on this planet of 30 meter resolution, analyzing them in terms of presence of water or no water. So you have here two screen captures of water close to Baghdad, where we see basically presence or absence of water over 30 years. And in the map below, you have the changes, uh, whether they're positive or negative over time. And you see close to Baghdad, we have a clear water deficit that is appearing over time. Uh, this map is again uh, globally accessible at 30 meter resolution. Uh, it's, uh, you have much more uh, information than the pure water presence. So the temporal dimension is, uh, can be captured and uh, needs to be assessed and used uh, when bringing all this information together in support to decision making. Uh, the latest products are using Copernicus data, so we can really increase the resolution and have more uh, uh, regularly updated information. So this is also where you can basically access the various layers. As I said, uh, there are quite a few uh, maps that are behind that. Uh, I have given you an idea on the really what what uh, what we can uh, uh, see and how we need to interpret this data. Uh, water seasonality is certainly something that is extremely important uh, uh, for biodiversity. So again, all this data can be uh, downloaded uh, and are accessible uh, through the UN Biodiversity Lab. Then the last uh, set of products are actually derived from the uh, Joint Research uh, Center's Digital Observatory for Project Areas. Uh, we are also mapping uh, around 20 key global indicators uh, that are uh, assessed at uh, country level, at uh, eco-region level, at site level uh, for each project area. One is uh, of particular interest because it has been used to report progress uh, uh, of the biodiversity strategy in the context of uh, the Aishi targets. It's the PROTCON indicators. It's how well are countries doing in connecting uh, project areas uh, in, uh, 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 in targeting 17% of, of the, the areas covered by project areas and that need to be well connected. So this indicator is useful for, for reporting purposes and the maps are again downloadable from uh, the UN Biodiversity Lab. Uh, we have also the data at eco-region level and you will find again on the website that is indicated uh, uh, on the on, the, on this slide here, you can have access to the fact sheets uh, describing the other products that we that we are happy to share. So, two, three points I would like to stress to conclude this presentation. So, it's almost impossible in this session uh, to uh, document the wealth of information that is available worldwide and in the UN Biodiversity Lab. But if we really think about how to move further, if we really want to have one-stop shop. Uh, for biodiversity data. How can we do that? Because there are plenty of data sets that are more and more coming. So we really need first to make sure that the data sets are updated. At the time I'm speaking, the data already need to be collected again. And we need to all work together and federate all the efforts to make sure that we put the services in place that would allow the UN Biodiversity Lab to have real-time up-to-date information regarding all of the information that is provided. There's a need to, you will have seen, I mean, I've presented three different platforms presenting data. There's a need to bring these platforms together. We really, really want to have one reference where the data are all valid, uh, assessed by scientific experts so that we have really reference material that we speak about the same indicators. Uh, it's very, extremely important for policymaking that we have really reference material. So this is something that we will need to think about in the future of UN Biodiversity Lab. 
And so there's a need, I think it's the right time now to really have a converging efforts uh, towards setting up a global reference platform for biodiversity and stop the proliferation of all this information. We need to work together more effectively uh, to really uh, change basically our world for, for the better. So I think I had seven minutes for presentation. I use a timer and I'm exactly now at seven minutes. Thank you. Over to you, Raphael. First one, if, uh, what questions do you have on the JRC data? And um, we have more questions after that one. If you want to, to use this first one and put something and then move forward with the next, please do so. Um, you see we have uh, one that is just dropping there. And what if you just want to take the questions and we can have the conversation? Yeah, for sure. The, the GSC uh, has been uh, working very closely, of course, uh, with uh, the World Copernicus program. And there are quite a number of uh, marine products, uh, sea surface temperature, chlorophyll, uh, all things that uh, are actually uh, processed also partly in house, uh, given that uh, the Copernicus program is really one of the European Commission and the data are all available. We are always keen to hear and listen to user requirements because we also at the GSC are there to uh, transform the user requirements Quest, you know, in products that can be useful by you. So we, we do use it, uh, not so much for the world atlas of desertification because uh, the topic is really terrestrial. Uh, for the one on the global surface water, we are speaking about inland water, but for the digital observatory for project areas, we have obviously some information about the marine project areas. How often does data get to the GSC for processing? Well, we are completely linked with the Copernicus program. I think uh, uh, everybody knows it's uh, the Copernicus program is the one of the commission. So we have our fingers really in this kind of thing. So certain types of data are typically real time data uh, for emergency purposes. In the case of natural disasters, we have uh, a full unit dedicated to, you know, to uh, this kind of situation so that we can acquire also uh, in support to the policymakers real-time imagery for fast responses. And then the rest is basically like everybody else. We share data. Uh, all the data are flowing constantly from Copernicus, from Landsats, and are available at the fingertips. They're various services. So uh, it really depends on the service. And well, I have a question. And we want, we're looking at how we can integrate data on biodiversity and how we can integrate data on, on other issues as well, because we are, in Costa Rica, we've been working actually also, GRC is part of an initiative on the EO toolkit for sustainable cities and human settlements that is related to the DG11. And cities is also a very important thing that we have to work on. And is very much related to the biodiversity issues that we have to address for urban areas and uh, how we interact with it. And no, we, that's yeah. that's exactly my role as the manager of the Knowledge Center for Biodiversity. This, it has been set, set up one year ago because the issue is so transversal. You need information on everything. And indeed, the map that you are uh, 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 talking about, this global human settlement layers, is a unique set of products. And uh, I know you and Biodiversity Lab is right now importing this data <laughs> that we produced uh, it's about, it's not only about biodiversity, it's about the pressures, it's about understanding and monitoring the pressures. The world atlas of desertification is showing the hotspots where we really, really need to look at uh, uh, in priority because this is where we have highest levels of, of degradation. And we speak in terms of not only you know, physical, biophysical degradation, but you know, the human degradation, the, the, the poverty, the, the areas where aridity is really transforming the landscape. So it has to be, biodiversity is really about everything. And this is why the challenge is so big in bringing all this information in a coherent way. So yes, again, we need to work all together. The first thing is certainly to collect the data. The other one is to transform this data into tools and indicators that can be used for decision-making. So a huge challenge indeed. Great, thanks. I see a uh, comment from um, a person named Lucas Mosek. Mosek. Um, he's talking about this uh, also a, a new a, a platform that he's mentioning uh, that can be connected to these processes as well. And the idea is, yeah, how we can, this work that is being done at UN level, UE, and here in our region in, Costa, uh, in uh, the Americas, uh, with uh, also the geo, the group of air observations that is trying to move things together and with different initiatives like what Lucas is mentioning. I don't know if Lucas wants to say a few words. 
Yeah, thank you very much. Hello, uh, yeah, I'm Lucas from Sensor Community and we operate the worldwide largest air quality sensor network. And we try since six years to reach out and uh, to Joint Research Center, EEA and the UN. And uh, it's really like zero response. So our question is like, um, it's like, is the political will missing? What else is missing? Because technology wise, uh, it is fully integrated in a, and uh, ministry uh, in the Netherlands, like our data set has an own uh, data portal. So we have on all levels proven uh, that technology wise, it is possible to merge it with the official reference station data to display it, to make it accessible as open data. So what is missing to integrate it into your great work and your platform and who to speak to that answers an email or a message that would be great information. Thank you so much. Well, from the GSC side, certainly please write to me and I can happy to share uh, your, your, your information with the air quality team uh, unit that is occurring that I'm surprised you didn't receive any, any, uh, any, any reply uh, for sure. Uh, I think they would be very interested uh, to hear about, about this work. Uh, I think we have been quite pioneering at the GSC in developing, you know, uh, web services to share data automatically. And this is typically the case of uh, the, the digital observatory for point areas where we automatically can share data to whoever you know need them so we really have you know the 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 the, the, the importance of open access and, and and easy access to the data is absolutely vital for 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 everyone and certainly for policy so please get back to me i will certainly pass the message uh, internally um, for un biodiversity lab that's uh, i leave it over to to the colleagues from from the un lab to 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 see how to to use this this kind of data Esa es la palabra. Muchas gracias y espero que todos puedan ver mis filminas. Entonces, el Centro de Investigación Conjunta es el, el servicio interno científico de la Comisión Europea y la idea es compartir esta información eh, de forma transparente y sencilla a los tomadores de decisiones. Y trabajamos para compartir datos, básicamente, que obtenemos también por del UNBL. Voy a hablar de tres conjuntos de datos que me parecen que son los más relevantes. Por supuesto, va a haber más datos y estamos trabajando en obtener más datos. Los primeros productos son la, eh, bueno, es el Atlas Global de la Desertificación e incluye un conjunto de 14 mapas globales eh, de indicadores biofísicos, sociales y económicos que si convergen, eh, llamamos esto la evidencia de convergencia y si los traslapamos, vemos eh, mapas de estrés hídrico, de eh, población, sobrepoblación, eh, áreas que van a requerir atención por degradación, por ejemplo, y riesgo de desertificación. Y el mapa aquí está realizando un, eh, eh, un enfoque eh, más de cerca, un zoom a zonas que son más eh, que se pueden acceder o que tienen datos con los cuales podemos acceder a la información en el UNBL. Aquí vemos la lista de todos los conjuntos de datos eh, utilizados. Una de las lecciones del de diálogo que vamos a llevar hoy a nuestras, eh, nuestras casas es que no podemos trabajar por silos. Eh, en silos, tenemos que trabajar conjuntamente y ayudar a apoyarse uno, el, uno al otro a tomar decisiones adecuadas. Entonces, aquí podemos ver áreas que requieren mayor atención con respecto a la degradación. Vemos el enlace aquí al Atlas y cómo descargar todos los datos pues, eh, subyacentes. Y todo está relacionado a lo de ese número 15 que está enlazado a todo, que es pues muy eh, transversal. Otro producto eh, que eh, desarrollamos con es que todos los píxeles en esta resolución de eh, tiene que ver con en los píxeles de resolución que vemos es sobre eh, agua. Agua aquí vemos eh, la presencia en este mapa de la presencia de agua cerca de Bagdad en 30 años y usted tiene que 
pues analizar si va a ser positivo o negativo a lo largo del tiempo. Vemos un déficit claro eh, de hídrico que va a surgir a lo largo del tiempo. Aquí vemos una resolución de 30 metros y que brinda mucha más eh, información. Entonces, se puede capturar eh, esta dimensión y se puede evaluar, se puede utilizar una vez que tengamos toda la información y ayudar en la toma de decisiones. Después se utilizan datos para aumentar la resolución y tener información más actualizada, regular. Aquí podemos ver también los, eh, las capas de valores. Hay varios mapas detrás de esto. Esto es para darle una idea sobre lo que podemos observar y cómo interpretar eh, los datos. También es muy también es muy importante ver la estacionalidad del agua, eh, que es importante para la biodiversidad. Y esta información se puede cargar a través del UNBL. El último conjunto de datos se derivan del observatorio digital para áreas eh, áridas. Tenemos eh, 20 indicadores globales que se evalúan a nivel país. Perdón, no para áreas áreas, es para áreas protegidas. Eh, un área es de interés particular utilizado para trazar el proceso del en contexto de la biodiversidad eh, de las metas de Aichi, eh, que también le va al país en conectar las áreas protegidas y poder eh, cubrir 17% de las áreas eh, de la cubierta del suelo, mantenerlo en sistemas bien conectados eh, como parte de la meta 11 de Aichi, del CBD. También esto se encuentra en el sitio del Internet. No está en esta filmina, pero tenemos las hojas eh, técnicas que podemos compartir con ustedes que brindan mayores datos. Ahora, tres puntos que quisiera enfatizar para concluir. Es imposible documentar una sesión tan corta. Eh, toda la riqueza de información disponible a nivel mundial y, eh, y en el UNBL. Si pensamos en cómo avanzar, si no quisiera tener como un solo repositorio para datos de la biodiversidad, ¿cómo lo podemos lograr? Porque siempre están surgiendo los datos globales eh, de, y se están actualizando constantemente. Hay que recolectar los datos y hay que trabajar conjuntamente eh, para establecer servicios eh, que puedan ayudar el acceso a datos. Y así el UNBL tendrá información actualizada. Necesitamos también bueno, presenté las tres plataformas de datos. Hay que unir estas plataformas. Queremos una referencia en donde los datos pueden utilizarse, eh, puedan ser datos de alto valor, en eh, donde los expertos puedan acceder a ella. Es extremadamente importante tener información de primera mano, información de referencia. Y es importante pensar esto eh, con respecto al futuro del UNBL. Este es el momento propicio para hacer un esfuerzo eh, convergente y poder trabajar conjuntamente, efectivamente, y eh, cambiar el mundo para que sea un mundo mejor. Así que creo que ya Llevo siete minutos. Le devuelvo la palabra, a Rafael. Muchas gracias. Es muy interesante su presentación. Gregor. Me gustaría ahondar más y aprender más para trabajar con ustedes en estos desafíos. y poder utilizar datos de una forma más eficiente y lograr que los tomadores de decisiones tengan acceso a estos datos eh, actuales y así eh, realizar cambios correctos y sostenibles. Vamos a compartir ahora el enlace al Jamboard. Ya tenemos una pregunta. 
eh, podemos participar, eh, de, tenemos el Jamboard. No sé si ustedes conocen el Jamboard y así podemos pues compartir de una forma más eh, participativa. Y allí tenemos preguntas para ustedes. Y durante la conversación podemos pues eh, tener eh, este tipo de, de participación conjunta. Para ver cómo procedemos. Un segundito. Vamos a compartir. Yo puedo compartir la pantalla si desean. ¿Tiene usted el Jamboard? Me parece que sí. Excelente. Gracias. Gracias. Más, más sencillo. Se ve que ya tenemos personas en la sesión. Aquí tenemos la primera filmina. Vamos a la segunda filmina y explica cómo podemos utilizar el, el Jamboard. Vamos a responder a estas preguntas. La pregunta es, ¿qué preguntas tiene usted sobre el, los datos del Centro de Investigación Conjunta JRC de la Comisión Europea? No sé si usted quisiera responder a las preguntas. El JRC ha estado trabajando muy de cerca con el programa, eh, eh, con el programa, un programa marino, World Marinas Program, y la idea es procesar esos datos internamente porque es un, eh, son datos abiertos. Siempre nos gusta saber cuáles son los requisitos de los usuarios y los requisitos de ellos. Como digo, como dije, perdón, porque lo utilizamos no tanto para el Atlas Mundial de Desertificación, eh, pero para el mapa de agua de super, del área de superficie global. Es para agua, pues, eh, de forma a nivel interno, eh, inter, eh, agua en la zona terrestre, en el interior. Entonces, el eh, tenemos, eh, estamos participando con, eh, con respecto a datos eh, reales para emergencias, para eh, responder a desastres naturales. Tenemos solo una unidad completa que se encarga de brindar información eh, de, en tiempo real para una respuesta rápida en el caso de algún desastre natural. Y la idea es mantener los datos eh, fluyendo de Landsat, satelitales, etcétera, depende del servicio que se brinde. Tengo una pregunta. Estamos viendo cómo integrar datos sobre la biodiversidad aquí. ¿Cómo podemos integrar datos sobre otros temas también? En Costa Rica, por ejemplo, hemos estado trabajando eh, sobre la iniciativa sobre asentamientos humanos y ciudades sostenibles que es el ODS 11 y está, va muy de la mano con el tema de biodiversidad para áreas urbanas y cómo interactuar con ellas. Ese es mi papel como gestor del JRC. Hace un año se estableció porque esto es un tema tan transversal que necesitamos información de cualquier índole. Y por ejemplo, citamos capas de para asentamientos urba, eh, humanos. Entonces se requieren datos específicos para ese aspecto. Entonces no se trata solo de la biodiversidad, se entiende, se trata de la presión de monitorear y entender eh, las presiones y los puntos calientes que tenemos que tomar en cuenta donde tenemos el mayor nivel de degra degradación. No solo degradación biofísica, pero degradación humana, eh, pobreza, 
áreas en donde la aridez está transformando el paisaje, la biodiversidad, pues se trata un poco de todo y por eso el desafío es tan, eh, tan inmenso. Tenemos que, por ende, trabajar juntos, primero colectando los datos, transformando los datos luego a herramientas e indicadores que se pueden utilizar para la toma de decisiones. Es realmente un desafío. Excelente. Veo un comentario de eh, Lucas Mossi. Está mencionando una plataforma que se puede conectar a este proceso. Gracias, Lucas, por su comentario. Y vemos cómo todo este trabajo que se está realizando en nuestra sesión en las Américas. El geogrupo de observaciones que también está intentando eh, utilizar o establecer varias iniciativas, tal como menciona Lucas. Sí, soy eh, Lucas de eh, que tenemos una red so de Center Community y en seis, por seis años hemos estado tratando de eh, unirse al UNBL sin con cero respuesta. Tenemos preguntas sobre la mejora de la calidad del, del aire, eh, bienestar eh, humano eh, integrado plenamente y está integrado. Nuestros conjuntos de datos forman parte de los datos de los Países Bajos eh, a nivel del gobierno de los Países Bajos. Entonces queremos poder, eh, bueno, eh, agregar estos datos al UNBL. Eh, ¿Por qué no lo podemos eh, integrar a su plataforma? ¿Y a quién le hablo que me pueda responder, eh, que pueda responder a mis correos? Gracias. ¿Quién sería un punto de contacto? Bueno, del lado de eh, del eh, GCC, yo por supuesto voy a compartir sus datos con el equipo de calidad de aire. Eh, voy a por supuesto, no sé por qué no ha recibido ninguna respuesta, pero será de gran interés escuchar de su trabajo. Tenemos servicios de Internet y tenemos también, bueno, el Observatorio Digital de Bucarest, que también podemos compartir datos eh, con cualquier persona que los necesite. Entonces, sabemos cuál es la importancia de los datos eh, claves y sencillos para todos. Por favor, me envía un mensaje y yo enviaré su mensaje eh, a los colegas del UNBL para que respondan a sus preguntas.